Good day, everyone, everywhere, and special greetings to all those seated in heavenly places in Jesus, our Messiah. The name of this broadcast is Cross the Border, and this is our weekly live uh, prophecy reality edition. So if it's uh, Wednesday morning and you're listening live, come on over to the chat room at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Studio cam is on. Now, in the second segment, we're still going through our history of uh, Wycliffe in England and his war against uh, the papacy, or popery, I should say, which because that just covers about everything that the papacy was doing through its uh, Holy Roman Empire uh, throughout the entire Euro European theater. And yes, at the time of Wycliffe, uh, England was under the thumb of the papacy. It was the tenth of the kingdom that would fall away uh, eventually and be recorded in the uh, prophecy or the book of Revelation for us as the tenth of the kingdom that falls away. Uh, not named specifically, but it was the one that did. And it was the one that uh, avoided direct judgment against it when God judged the Holy Roman Empire about the end of the 1260 year period of history that the papacy did rule Rome. We'll be looking at the mendicant friars, the Franciscans and the Dominicans, and what they were doing for the papacy, how they uh, really uh, were, we could call them pre-Jesuits, because the Jesuits who came afterwards uh, took over the functions of both of those, um, uh, as far as the Inquisition goes, of uh, both of those uh, orders. But anyway, very interesting history. You'll definitely want to stick around for that, so make sure you do. Uh, well, anyway, as I usually I'm carrying on, trying to wake up uh, futures out there, uh, still writing my book. I've uh, written the, I've had the first part, part one done as a, uh, a defense of historicism. Uh, part two is, it's really, it's a defense of Kiliism, or Kilius defense, if you know what that is. Kiliism simply means a thousand, or, you know, it's the Greek for a thousand, so it's a defense of the millennial uh, reign of Christ and premillennialism. And that, that front has to be fought on several fronts because the amillennials is uh, the reformed thought on uh, the millennium and that's where there's n not really a defined thousand year period but it's kind of uh well the first resurrection according to everyone i have seen they place the first resurrection of uh, chapter 20 of the revelation let's see either at pentecost or at 70 AD, when the so-called Jewish paradigm, priest temple uh, paradigm, was uh, abolished, um, well, forever, and still is abolished today, uh, because uh, the Jews do not have their temple mount back or their temple, so the priest temple system is has is still has been abolished, and the Gentiles. Uh, still are trotting down uh, Jerusalem and specifically the Temple Mount. But so that's where the amillennialists p uh, put the uh, the first resurrection. But that's problematic, and so you'll have to stick around to to read my book. Or when I get it done, uh, I'll probably share everything on the air here. And I've shared most of the things in the book on the air already, but organizing them in such a way that you can just read it. And it's going to be, I'm trying to make it so it's not as scholarly, but more of a discussion, uh, so that trying to bring it down closer to earth, <laughs> where, where most people that will be able to understand it uh, conversationally. So there's a lot of repetition in it, but I, I think it's, I think it'll be good. I, I don't know. I'll have to get some pre-copies out there, get a few people that uh, might.
might volunteer to read it and give me some comments before I actually put it into publication. So if you want to be one of those, part one's done, I believe. I'm probably going to go through it one more time to look for typos and stuff because uh, because it's it's hard to see things, um, to, to see anything but what you think you wrote. <laughs> it, if you're a writer, you know what I'm talking about. So those typos are still there and you don't even, you're just kind of blind to them. Uh, anyway, um, I was listening to True News from yesterday and they're doing a great show over there at uh, the uh, FinTech conference in Singapore and talking about the mark of the beast. So we might talk about that a little bit more. Uh, also, uh, Rick Wiles and um, Chuck Baldwin got together. And I'm just, I'm really, I think I'm done with Chuck Baldwin um, uh, because of something he did uh, uh, on his one of his last uh, sermons. And I have that. So I want to talk about that for a few minutes. So let me just bring it up. Um, uh, Chuck Baldwin did a, uh, on November 10th, so this is very recent, he did a uh, sermon, the message is called The Times of the Great Falling Away. And of course, this is a reference to uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And the falling away and the revealing of the man of sin. And o only he put the falling away and he ties it to Zionism and the rise of uh, of dispensational futurism. He's saying that dispensational futurism and Zionism is the great falling away. And you know that's that's not bad. I mean, you know, it's 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 closer to the truth. Maybe um, it's a better speculation than the one they're waiting for, the dispensational futurists. So at least he is putting away dispensational futurism, just like um, Rick Wiles, I guess. Yeah, maybe. Rick Wiles has gone total a millennial, But something, um, Chuck Baldwin did something very disappointing. Uh, he actually misused references and how he misused his references is, so you can see this for yourself. You go to his uh, Liberty Fellowship MT channel there on YouTube. You can watch the Times of the Great Falling Away message. And you get about 12, 12 uh, minutes in, and he starts talking about the Antichrist. And of course, he goes to First John, where First John, where it's written, uh, little children, and there, there are many Antichrists. And so he wants to stick with that definition of Antichrist. So there are many Antichrists. And, but he uses Albert Barnes' commentary. And before he uses Albert Barnes' commentary, he goes into a spiel, and he says that, I don't read nothing that's not 100, 150 years old. He says, all the books I read are going back from to the early Reformation up to 100 or 150 years ago because it's just not worthwhile to read anything that was written after that. Totally useless, something like that. You'll, you'll hear the spiel. And what he's saying is basically is the Holy Spirit can't work through anybody today, so there's, there's no truth unless you go back 150 years. You know, I've studied uh, prophecy from the entire last 2,000 years. I've got a book here called The History of Apocalyptic Interpretation. It goes through all the apocalyptic interpretations that have been given by the most prominent writers uh, over the last 2,000 years. And just because something is old doesn't mean it's good. There, there's a lot of bad stuff out there that was written over 2,000 years, just as there's a lot of bad stuff. I'd say proportionally, anything that's good uh, has always been the minority. Anything that is... Holy Spirit, Bible, Revelation, uh, in line with the text of the Bible is not the norm, but it's the exception. Until you get to about the, Rev, uh, the Reformation. Of course, you had a lot of bad stuff then, but the Reformation fathers agreed on some things. So he thought, so he thought, oh, going back to the Reformation, so, all right, well, this ought to be good. He, he did say Albert Barnes, and I know Albert Barnes is a historicist. 
So he goes through the spiel, first, first John, and then he goes to the man of sin. And he reads the prophecy in context, the man of sin sitting in the temple of God, showing that he's God. And then he reads Albert Barnes. He reads a portion of Albert Barnes' commentary. And then he quits, and he goes back to First John. And he, and he uses it to back up his thesis that there is no specific identifiable Antichrist or line of men. Because Albert, the party reads in Albert Burns talks about, you know, kings being a lineage in the papacy, or not the papacy, but the man of sin can be referred to as a line of men. Okay, such as a line of kings or anyone who takes a, a certain position that is replaced by somebody else uh, when their time or when death occurs, something like that. But then he stops there and he jumps over to, to hold out his message that there is no specific identifiable Antichrist. And he goes back to, there are many Antichrists. So I thought, well, that's peculiar. I know Albert Barnes was... A historicist. So I go to where he reads it. I find the exact quote he uses on my eSword. I still have it loaded here on the page, Second Thessalonians. And if I open up my commentary to Albert Barnes, oops, man of sin. So that's Second Thessalonians. And so I'll open up the commentary there. And so you can read that for yourself. You got your Albert Barnes commentary open and where he, where he quotes. Albert Barnes. But see, if you read everything Albert Barnes, he just takes that one small place and, and he doesn't even mention it. Because I would, I would mention that. You know, I wouldn't skip over that, but he ignores it. I know he had to re have read it, but before and after the, the quote that he pulls out, and I say abuses, because Albert Barnes definitely, undeniably, unequivocally names the papacy as the seat of the man of sin. And there is no getting around it. But for some reason, and that's what I find really disappointing, that he wouldn't even mention, he would use Albert Barnes, and the way a lot of people that misuse, misuse quotes or take things out of context uh, to use for their own purpose. Not the he doesn't use the purpose that Albert Barnes stated the things that he quotes for, but he uses them for a different purpose. He just uses Albert Barnes, you know, written, what, 150s or more years ago, to back up his thesis, but not to go to the point that Albert Barnes brought that up for. So I found that very disappointing. And the Jew-hating and the Trump-bashing is really wearing on me, man. Um, you know, I, I don't like Trump any more than I like any of the other presidents. Well, I have to say, I like him better than I like Obama. I like him better than I liked Bush. I guess I do like him better than I've liked any president probably since Ronald Reagan. Okay? And I, I liked Ronald Reagan because he was going to get rid of the Department of Education. You know, and he outed the IRS as not collecting, uh, using one penny of the income tax for, for going towards government services. It was all to pay the, the, uh, the, um, the interest on the debt. And of course, we know that's, that's a, um, uh, Federal Reserve, uh, is a Vatican banker operation, okay, in America. They, we had a Federal Reserve coup of the U.S. Treasury. Of course, the Federal Reserve is not federal. It has no reserves. It's not U.S. government. It's none of those things. It's a foreign banking cabal controlled by the Antichrist in his shadow government. So for some reason, and I, so I'm done. So I'm looking for something on Sunday to replace um, Chuck Baldwin. I am going to write Chuck Baldwin a letter, though. I have contacted him in the past. I've sent him some of my books. Uh, he was very cordial and, you know, uh, about, you know, in his co communications with me. And uh, so I had hope, especially when, so I'm hoping that he'll keep reading those Reformation Fathers, but I'm going to write him a long letter and ask him why he refuses to identify the Antichrist as the Reformers have done. 
and I'm going to call him out on this. So, so pray for me or with me about that, that God will help me to reach this man with the truth and about being Protestant. Because if he's not going to protest, then well, I don't want anything to do with him. If he doesn't want to be a true Protestant. If he's only going to use historicist quotes or misuse them, then I'm done, man. That's all there is to it. You can see what Satan wants people to do is he wants you to hate mankind. He doesn't care how you do it. What way you choose to hate your fellow man, that's what Satan wants you to do. Now, there are the feminists. They hate men. And then there are men that hate women. God, you know, Satan loves that. But you know what? We're supposed to hate sin. Because I've known feminists, and I know that they have all their reasons for hating men, for, for example. Or likewise, there are men that hate women for good reasons, too. You know why? Because they've been sinned against. They've been hurt by the sin that people have that's been leveled against them personally. So instead of hating sin... They hate, the, the hatred is put and blamed towards a cross section of humanity, be it men, women, some people even hate children. And there are people that hate old people. Gosh, somebody hates me just because I'm old. Okay? Or they hate the Jews, or they hate the Russians, or they hate, you know, whoever, you just name it, Mexicans. They hate blacks. And they're white, they're black people that hate whites. You know? And they're people that are self-hating and self-loathing. You know, it's, it, Satan doesn't care who you hate. He just doesn't want you to hate sin and love righteousness. He wants you to hate your fellow man because you're then in his club. And that is the club that hates humanity because humanity was created in an image of God. And that's why, that for no other reason, does Satan hate them. I'm sure he's got a lot of reasons there added on to that one. But basically, that's it. They're created in the image of God. God has sent a redeemer for mankind. And Satan hates all mankind. And if he can get you to join in his hate club, then the, he certainly wants you to be that. So my message to Rick Wiles and to um, Chuck Baldwin is you're falling for one of Satan's favorite ploys, and that is to pit you against your fellow man on the basis of race, religion, color, creed, gender, whatever reason. Now I'll tell you what, Israel. Okay. I agree. I, I'm not into the modern Zionist movement. I think Christian Zionism is an oxymoron. And anyone who participates in it is oxymoronic. Okay. And it shouldn't be. And I agree that, you know, uh, Israel shouldn't have, uh, we shouldn't be supporting that nation any more than we should be supporting any other nation. But I don't hate those people any more than I hate the people from Turkey or Russia or Zimbabwe or Mexico or anywhere else. There are all people everywhere. And there are evil people in every nation. There are good people in every nation. Every nation has God's people in it. The kingdom of God is, is, is pan, is trans international, transnational. It's, it's in every nation of the earth. And we're to reach out and uh, love every nation, even our enemies in every nation, the way Jesus taught us to. We're to preach the gospel, but to have a special vitriol and hatred and to pound that on that week after week after week, it just gets very old. Now, President Trump, I know he's... He's lived his whole life. He's lived a debauched life. Okay, that's obvious. He's a self-centered man. And perhaps he's actually genuinely met Jesus Christ for the first time in his life. Maybe he's had a come to Jesus moment. So he's in the wrong movement. But you know what? Even those people that are in error have the word of God. 
And it can be preached. It's God's word that will not return void. And so I'm going to pray for the man. I mean, he's doing some good things out there. He's standing up for my religious liberties, you know, as much as he can, as, as much as I could hope for, more than I would ever get from Barack Obama or the Bushes. Okay. So singling out certain people for hatred or certain uh, segment of mankind for vitriol and hatred is not the Christian thing to do. And it certainly is not good for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, well, you're listening to Cross the Border. I'm Nicholas Arthur, and uh, I'll be back in a few minutes. You're listening to my Prophecy Reality Edition. Don't go anywhere. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Welcome back. You're listening to Cross the Border, our Prophecy Reality Edition. Well, I think I'm going to talk a little bit about well, the man of sin, since we touched on that in our first uh, segment, and uh, the mark of the beast. So I think uh, we need to go through this uh, uh, do a synopsis here. And I wrote in my book, and if you go to a page 44 of uh, When the Third Temple is Built, the Rapture Play Will Begin, I uh, have a segment there, uh, part of this chapter is the New Testament Temple, where I outline several verses that Paul writes to us in 1 Corinthians. He says, first of all, he says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. So where is the temple of God? Well, it's not a building. Hmm. Um, when Jesus was, before uh, Paul showed up on the scene and wrote, uh, Jesus was on the ground, and the temple building was still there. Okay, And the temple building was still there when Paul wrote. So he's saying, not that temple over there and in Jerusalem, 
And I believe he's, he's writing to the Corinthians when he says, Know ye not that you are the temple of God? Now, uh, when Jesus, even Jesus walking in around the temple and commenting on the physical building, he says, he refers to his own body as a temple. Okay? He opens up a whole new idea about what the temple is. And so Jesus really begins it, the, our body is being a temple, because he refers to his body as a temple. When he says, tear this temple down in three and a half days, Yes, so he refers to his body as a temple. So 3.16, 1 Corinthians 3.16, Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? That's his question. Do you know that? Well, we should know it, because he wrote it to us, and yeah, I know that. Next verse, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Any confusion out there? Where's the temple of God? Where is it? <laughs> is it over in Jerusalem? Oh, it got tore down 2,000 years ago. When are they going to rebuild the temple? No, 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 no. The New Testament temple is not a building made with hands. It's not brick and mortar. It's not hewn stone. Not the New Testament temple. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Just in case you didn't get it the first couple times, Paul repeats himself. He says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, and you ha which you have of God, and ye are not your own? We are the temple of God. Don't you know that? What? Don't you know that you are the temple of God? The Holy Spirit dwells in you? And you are not your own? Second Corinthians 6.16 And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. We, his church. The church that Jesus said, I will build. Remember that Jesus said, I will build my church? Okay? We are that church. The church is that temple. The church is the temple of God. It's a building built without hands. Okay? So now we have to ask the question. So when the same author, that is Paul, prophesies of the man of sin who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God. Where does he sit? In a building made of stone, brick and mortar, hewn stone? No, I don't think so. Paul made it absolutely clear by this time that, you know, that the church, the people, we are the temple of God. So when the man of sin sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, several questions must be asked. One, just think about this. Is God through Paul referring to to the soon, okay, let's go back. We're going back in time now. When Paul wrote this to the Thessalonians, there was a temple over there in Jerusalem. Okay, we're back first century. Paul's writing to the Thessalonians. The temple hasn't even been destroyed yet. Okay? What year is this? Uh, maybe about somewhere between 50 and 60 AD. Question is, when, God, when Paul refers to this man of sin in the future, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, this man of sin who would be revealed, okay, when that withholding force was taken out of the way, is, Paul through, is, is God, through Paul, referring to the soon-to-be-destroyed temple that was standing in Jerusalem when he penned these words in the first century? I wish 
I could get some hands out here in the audience. Anybody got an answer for that? Well, the answer is obviously not. Next question. Is he referring to a yet to be built future temple without explicitly stating that it will be built again after it's destroyed? Because remember, he is a prophet. This is God's prophet prophesying something that's going to happen in the future. After he teaches us unequivocally that we are the temple of God, and he prophesies that the man of sin is going to sit in the temple of God. So is he referring to a yet-to-be-built future temple without explicitly stating that it will be built again after it's destroyed? So see, I'm leaving out a lot of stuff. There's a temple over there. If it's going to be a physical temple, a brick and mortar of hewn stone over there on the Temple Mount or wherever it should be in Jerusalem, okay? If that's what it's going to be, shouldn't he tell us that, hey, that built, because people go, what? What, Paul, you nuts, man? Wait a minute. That and then, especially after it got destroyed, go, well, how's he going? How's this going to be fulfilled? The, it's been destroyed, so he left out because to avoid confusion. If he's referring to an actual physical building on the ground, a brick and mortar, or hewn stone, well, he would have to tell us it will be built again after it's destroyed, because it was over there. It was destroyed. So everyone after the 70 AD destruction would go, this is nothing. Paul's talking about the temple. It's destroyed. Paul was wrong. Okay? And so he would have had to tell us. And so expecting us to assume, that's what he means. So he said this to the Thessalonians. They were supposed to have understood. He said, don't you remember when I was with you, I told you these things? Like they were supposed to have understood it. But Because uh, maybe he told them that it's going to be built again. And then after it's destroyed, maybe that's what he told them and he left out. What do you think? But for the rest of us that are just reading it, we would have to assume that's what he means. But no, absolutely not. Third question. This is your multiple choice, okay? It's not one, it's not two. Let's look at three. Or does he expect us to believe that the temple is a reference to that which he has already taught us to understand about the New Testament church being the temple of God, as in the previous references? And there's only one acceptable answer. That is that God expects us to believe what we should have already learned, that we are the temple of God, and that this prophecy is about the man of sin taking the place of God in the hearts and minds of men in the visible church on the earth. And in context, remember the great apostasy, the falling away, and in context, the very heart of a great apostasy. Now, the question is, did this ever happen in history? Because here we are 2,000 years later. Has anything like this prophecy happened in the past? And the answer is yes. A great apostasy rose up. And to this very day, to this very day, that great apostasy, that falling away, with a man of sin taking the place of God in the hearts and minds of the adherents of this great apostasy has only become greater and larger, so much so that today it is still the greatest apostasy that has ever risen up in the earth with two billion adherents, give or take, on the earth. That is what? That's um, two, seven billion people on earth, two billion adherents. That's uh, more than a quarter. That's probably a third. Yeah, a third, you know, that's, that's, that's huge. That's more than any other congregation on the earth. And that is the Roman Catholic Church, the man of sin sitting in the Vatican on the seven hills of Rome. The great harlot church 
taking the place of God, the vicar of God on earth. Isn't that taking the place of God? The man of sin taking the place of God in the hearts and minds of men, in the visible church on earth, and in context of the heart of a great, very great apostasy. And see, that's why I got excited when I heard Chuck Baldwin going there. He's going, and yes, they're going back to the Reformation Fathers. I don't read anything. But, you know, it doesn't do any good if you, you read them, but ignore the parts don't fit, that don't fit in with your particular bent, especially if you're on a hatred bent. This hatred is, is like an addiction, man. And we are all tempted with them. It's one of Satan's greatest and most favorite temptations. Boy, if he can get you to hate your fellow man. But you know, Jesus said about that, if you hate your fellow man in your heart, you're a murderer. I want to avoid that at all costs. I don't want to be a murderer. I have hated. But I repent of that nonsense. It's not the Jews, and that was my broadcast last week. It's not the Jews, it's not the Templars, it's not the Illuminati, it's the Antichrist. Well, you're listening to Cross the Border. Uh, this is a Prophecy Reality Edition. I uh, hope that uh, I can reach people, because, you know, I, I love all these people. I mean, I think Rick Wiles, and I was listening to his broadcast about the Mark of the Beast, well, not the Mark of the Beast, but the FinTech thing over there in Singapore. So he does a great show. I just wish he'd get off the hate thing. You know, get off of the hate drug. Um, run from it, you know, because it, it's not becoming. And it only marginalizes you and your message. You need to out the true Antichrist. You need to become true Protestants and join the Reformation Fathers in their protest against the real, true, still existent, greatest apostasy that has ever written up, risen up on the earth, or reared up on the earth, and its man of sin, the Antichrist. So certainly there are many Antichrists. We get that. But you can't say, just stay there and vindicate the papacy from its historical and biblical position as the great Antichrist, the great, the man of sin, the one that martyred hundreds of millions of Bible-believing Christians and others, and liberal, even liberal Catholics. I mean, if a Catholic would come to the aid of their neighbor who was being persecuted by the church, they would kill the Catholics too. I've read the history. It's all there. It's open for you. Anyway, the mark of the beast, that's where we're going next. It's a reality, and it is coming. Uh, listening to these guys over there, they see the direction it's going. But without an authority, you can't have all of these different currencies. It's all going to have to get down to one, and that is exactly where it's going. It's already being planned behind the scenes, I'm sure. And all of the new technology, that's where it's all going, is to the mark of the beast, the one monetary system. So we're going to have a huge failure here, monetarily. When the dollar falls, and it's amazing uh, that the dollar has held up this long, but I believe that their Federal Reserve, the, the money cabal, that's controlled by the Antichrist and his shadow government. I believe that they're actually trying to destroy the monetary system, but it kind of has a life of its own. But it eventually is going to fall. It's just a matter of time. And when they're ready, it will. They'll find some reason to do it. There will be some great failure. And you can see the little failures here and there in certain countries. You can see how it's going to go when the dollar finally fails. But when the dollar fails, it will take the whole world with it. Because the dollar is, has been, since World War II, the re reserve currency of the world. Then, they have to come together, and they will come together. That's where it's going, with a one-world 
digital monetary system and everyone will be required great and small rich and poor free and bond just as it says there in revelation chapter 13 and all of the players have been identified and are in operation right now the image of the beast is the united nations it is a worldwide image through which the Holy Roman Empire of the whole earth is governed. So it's not the old world order that was confined to Western Europe and the Holy Roman Empire of 1260 years. This is the new world order because America, the Americas, are the new world. And that's where the new world order has its seat. The United Nations in New York City and the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., is not one of the states of the United States of America. That is a, an enclave that was designed and put in force through trickery, sleight of hand, and intrigue. The District of Columbia was given to the United States of America to centralize power in the new world for the Antichrist. Read F. Tupper Saucy's Rulers of Evil and decide for yourself, is the ring of truth there? It absolutely is. All you need to do is concentrate power. You don't have to worry about the guise with which you brought that concentration of power, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, which they had to add to it, in order to get all of the, uh, they had to add those rights. So they said those rights are implied. Yeah. No, we want them written down. So they had to add the cons, the, the Bill of Rights, not the new rights that they've, or, or new, uh, amendments that they've added since them. Most of those are trash. We're only added to further dilute our rights, actually. All they had to do was concentrate power and look at what they've done with their concentration of power. The Constitution and the Bill of Rights are almost dead. That's right, almost dead. <laughs> and uh, we'll see how long it's last, but it gets worse and worse every year. I know, because I left off from the socialist monetary mo uh, numbering system some 25 years ago. And ever since then, I have been gradually losing rights. They've taken rights and they converted them into privileges and benefits. Like if I want to go into business, well, I guess I can, but certain businesses I can't do without getting a business license now because I don't have a right to do that anymore. There's so many things we as Americans had a right to do. If you wanted, if we wanted to practice law, we'd put out our shingle, we'd practice law, and the, the market would govern what we were doing. But now we have to babysit everybody, you know? Because if someone was successful, then they would be successful. Um, but if someone was violating and not doing a good job, well, then the word would get around. And But you don't have those rights anymore. Now you have to get a bar, get licensed at the bar, and, you know, all that nonsense. So you can't practice law <laughs> without a license. And I, I don't think you can cut hair, do fingernails, tattoos, uh, what, what else? <laughs> uh, isn't these poor, uh, dental hygienists? They go to school, but they can't open up their own shop. I can't just go to a dental hygienist. I, but I have to have a, go to a dentist and they are now licensed. On, it's, it's all to control. It's all about control. And it just gets worse and worse and worse as time goes on. We have fewer and fewer liberties in this nation. And once they get that one world monetary system in place, but they're going to need it. See, because when the dollar fails, it's going to be a worldwide crisis and people are just going to cry for a one world monetary system. We have to do something. And, and it's, they're not going to have gold backed. 
I mean, they might pretend it's gold backed, but who cares if, if only one authority has the money? It doesn't matter whether they say it's gold backed or not. Well, we'll see how that works. But whatever the reason, people are going to cry for a one world monetary system where it will be fair and equal and full of social justice nonsense. And uh, they'll probably offer everybody so many digits or whatever the new monetary system, uh, what was it they, they offered in 1988 um, when they announced it? Um, the, uh, oh, the Phoenix, that's it. The monetary system called the Phoenix, rising from the ashes of paper currency. You can read about that in The Economist magazine. Uh, I have that in my in my book. The Rapture Will Be Cancelled, I believe it's Chapter 10, The Mark of the Beast. So you might want to check that out. And if you're interested, go to my website. Make sure you subscribe there, crosstheborder.org, and click on the free ebook tab. Well, that's all I have time for. We'll see you next time. May the Almighty bless you and keep you. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crosstheborder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crosstheborder.org. News app. Get it now.